Can you see the presentation now? Yeah, right? Yes. Good. Yes, can. Teacher, okay. I can see anything. You my can't? screen, my screen is all black, but it marks me um, inside of the of the session, but I can see anything. Really? Yes, teacher. I don't know if it's the application. What about the others? Are you able to see the presentation? Yeah, I can see yes. it. Yes. Yes, teacher, I can see it. Well, I, yeah, I can see it because it freezes at some point. Oh, really? Maybe if you yeah. turn off your camera, that might help. Or turn it on, <laughs> the opposite. I, I don't think that will help. But, uh, that would probably uh, put the PC a little bit more... Lower, right? Uh, Low, actually, it uh, down. the application uh, don't let me turn on my camera. No, really? Well, I don't know how to help you because I'm very stupid at technology, but... Me too, teacher. <laughs> oh my God. But well, I, I, what about I, this? I... Listen to me and yes. I'm recording the session so you will be able to watch it. Uh, uh, it, good. Uh, it sounds good. Perfect, thank you. Just uh, uh, focus on, on, on your listening skill. Yes, thank you, teacher. Okay, thank you. Well, as I told you, uh, your videos were really valuable. They, they, can you turn off your mic, please? Ah, oh, thanks. Um, your insights into the power of language were uh, relevant and some of them were remarkable and your participations in the forums actually enhanced discussion, dialogue and interaction regarding your thoughts. So I decided to include language acquisition theories in order to complement what we discussed, what we share, and uh, this is the, the presentation of a first, you know, and foremost language acquisition theories. Just to keep on reflecting throughout the course, you know, because we keep on analyzing this, um, how language takes place, you know, how language learning happens. And it would be good to go back to childhood and to remember how we actually started learning. Um, well, not learning, started speaking, you know, started using language. Um, there are different theories, you know, and Currently, it's in the research agenda because we keep on investigating and we keep on um, um, adapting theories for um, language acquisition and language development and how language emerged. So uh, the first theory has to do with behaviorism. And this is quite related, you know, to a way of thinking that actually a uh, change paradigms, you know, uh, it's also uh, uh, connected to the idea of uh, active learning and, uh, you know, actions and reactions. So this approach, because this is an approach, it's a theory, but an approach is actually a, the way societies in certain periods of time conceived a reality science, you know, uh, literature, art, etc. Um, well, it proposed that we human beings learn through operant conditioning and different stages throughout our chronological age. This is something that, um, you know, further investigated Piaget if you're familiar with him, uh, Piaget was a Swiss biologist who was into education issues. Um, well, he stated for about four stages of language development and learning development, learning conditions, you know, such as a pre-operational stages, uh, operant condition stages, 
post uh, operation stages. So um, he was actually trying to situate and uh, label the different stages in which we go through in order to develop learning and our cognitive skills. So he was also uh, investigating, you know, one of the most famous theories for a language to emerge, which was the relationship between the learner, the, the, the individual and the environment. Um, according to this theory of behaviorism, you know, which is really famous and discussed and controversial, language emerged for from our contact with the environment and we actually started uh, uh, somehow reproducing the sounds of nature and then well of course you know uh, the relationship between nature and individuals was paramount for reproducing sounds and give meaning to sounds you know such as rain wind fire etc so this could be also um, analyzed and observed by taking a look at the relationship and the bound between the mother and the child, where, um, you know, if, if you have already noticed in, in, you know, once in your life, have seen maybe with your brothers or with a relative or friends, how mothers talk to babies in a very slow manner in a very special fashion, you know, almost imitating the sounds a child would utter so that, you know, connection between them can take place, you know, and um, language uh, actually develops, you know, with that relationship, which is the sound, you know, and also uh, the movements of, you know, the mother's mouth you know gesticulation so it's very interesting to take a look at this um, theory there is another theory according to uh Perico and boyle this theory has to do with um, a language acquisition device we got in our brains as part of our collective memory you know it's a natural way we've got in order to develop language and according to the ANA test approach this is what makes us different from animals because we are actually programmed in order to produce language so we have this natural born ability in order to use language know language and communicate some linguistic knowledge is there in our brains, such as a hardware, in uh, order to be developed. But it's an innate nature. It's an sorry. It's an innate skill that we got according to the innatism, and this has to do also with the proposals at the beginning of Chomsky's uh, work, who stated that we actually have got a you know this um, language acquisition device that has to be polished work out and and further uh, developed it's a, a, a one of the theories regarding language and we have also um, another interesting language acquisition theory for mother tongue which is the interaction this uh, language acquisition theory has to do with uh, how language is learned through social interaction and how language is uh, accomplished by means of relationships uh, among others, you know, and, 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 you know, to a certain extent, this has to do with what Vygotsky further explored you know, regarding uh, a different concept of intelligence, such as the zone of proximal development, which is a, um, a zone for uh, growth, cognitive growth, language growth, 
or you know the opposite, the other way around, if it is not work effectively by a more knowledgeable peer. That is why the importance of a of social interaction uh, takes place because we need to share information with others. So uh, this is another proposal. This is another theory and approach to take a look at language. Now, regarding second language acquisition, remember that you have already discriminated and pointed out the differences between language learning and language acquisition in one of your tasks, which was related to uh, the comparison between contexts. And you actually came up with a comparative chart where you shed light on the commonalities or differences between these two settings. Well, according to the behaviorist perspective, this approach, which is a focus on second language acquisition now, um, we could find a relationship between the theory and the implementation of certain methodologies such as the audiolingual method. So what we need to do is to think of the theories and to, th and to contextualize the information, the data, for the current situation of language and the current situation for education, uh, education processes, such as teaching and learning. Everything is connected because you know, uh, dialogue, drills, repetitions uh, might be part of your activities and you might be following all your legal methods or, you know, the grammar translation method or a communicative approach. But certainly, you know, it has an impact whether you know the language theories or not, because you are shaping somehow a your teaching and your learning styles. Yeah. So um, it's not that you're conditioned by the theories, not even by the method, because the most important thing is to consider that we are all different and that we make up our very own way of learning and our very own way to teach. But we need to take into consideration internal and external factors that do have an impact, but in the end, you will have your very own style. But yeah, there is a relationship, um, you know, um, this approach uh, states that mistakes should be corrected immediately in order to avoid fossilization. So it actually has an impact on learning and teaching styles. And, you know, it's close related to first language acquisition, which is behaviorism. Now, while we are checking this second language acquisition theories and the previously seen first language acquisition theories, it will be good for you to think of certain activities you have experienced while learning English. In a classroom, outside the classroom, in a certain context in a different context, but that reflection is going to help you build, you know, construct your professional identity, regardless of your job, you know, regardless of your decisions uh, for becoming teachers, for becoming interpreters, for becoming translators, for becoming researchers, writers, linguists, etc. So it's a reflective exercise we need to carry out, okay? Next, the Enatis perspective in second language acquisition. Well, for this second language acquisition approach, English learners are seen to creatively construct the rules for the second language in a similar way they did for the first one. So this is a phenomenon linguists refer to as interference, you know, which is the term according to uh, applied linguistics to teaching and learning languages. 
So it's very interesting to uh, take a look at this perspective and how you know it states that the, the contrastive analysis is used in order to compare L1 and L2. You know, the picture you see there is somehow trying to represent the processes in which individuals go through while acquiring the second language. This is also called bilingualism, you know, and it's been studied by a, a couple of scholars, you know, and, and also for authorities regarding linguistics, such as a crashing or uh, or even Chomsky um, and, and some anthropologists as well, because it's the interest in the area of expertise for some linguistic anthropologists. Um, you, you, I can give you an example, you know, I, I had this a very close friend of mine who live in the United States, you know, and then um, moved to Mexico. Uh, she started learning and acquiring Spanish, but uh, she actually got a couple of constraints regarding this analysis. And she used to refer to the moon as Muna, you know, because she couldn't separate the word moon with the word Luna. So she somehow integrated both um, structures and in, you know, in, in an unconscious way, you know, she used to call it uh, Muna. So, um, it's also very interesting to think of, you know, these scenarios, because later on we will face theories which are very concrete, such as Krashen's five hypothesis for language acquisition, and we start deconstructing what we have read so far, because we have the idea of second language acquisition and in language learning, foreign language learning. And we will see how Krashen actually determines and states that language acquisition can take place in any context, at any age, whatever you are, you know. So um, it's very important to know the basis of second language acquisition, language acquisition, sorry, and language learning. Yes, to know the differences but to get to understand specific approaches and specific hypotheses, you know, which um, I think are important to be included for getting to know the processes of learning and teaching languages. So um, I'm going to be including that in the, in the agenda as well. The next one is the social interaction. And the social interaction, um, it's the way both, you know, native speakers and non-native speakers of the uh, language interact to make themselves understood. This is a negotiation. So um, new users of English, for instance, may use compensatory strategies. If you were my students in the strategies course, you might remember that the compensatory strategies have to do with the compensation of the lack of vocabulary, the lack of skills for communication. And this is what happens on a daily basis. Just think of yourself speaking in Spanish and suddenly you get stuck because you don't know the word you want to refer to. So when you are having a conversation, the other person is likely to help you know, to achieve meaning so that communication can keep on going. This is a negotiation, you know, and it's a construction that uh, emerges collaboratively. So um, in, in for this second language acquisition perspective, um, the, the role of uh, interaction is fundamental. OK, um, well, try to be reflective, try to be insightful and 
and analytical so that you can actually grasp all this information to be placed in your following activities, which have to do with classroom management. One more theory, which has to do with uh, what, um, you know, um, uh, uh, Brunner, Jerome Brunner, and, and also uh, Bigotsky uh, continue working with was uh, the role of, you know, sociocultural approach for uh, developing language and for developing learning. Um, this is a variety of, you know, what Piaget started with. So um, it's got commonalities with constructivism, with cognition, but it has more uh, focus on the social concern, you know, the interaction. So, um, knowledge is actively constructed by the learner. This is active learning that Piaget stated, but it, they included one important element, element, which is society and culture. You know, uh, students are not alone. You know, they need to share, they need to interact, and this is the process of knowledge construction. As I said, you know, what you need to do is to inquire the um, theories, to study the hypothesis, and to go to Piaget directly to Vygotsky, study Brunner, you just need to serve the net, and that's it. And to go for uh, over the crashing hypothesis, language acquisition, language theory, the filter hypothesis, the silent period, the um, natural hypothesis, in order to discover and place the information into your activities. I think you're going to find it really useful, you know, uh, to merge what the theory states, what the praxis states, you know, in your practicum, and also um, the ideas you got regarding teaching and learning. So we have three different dimensions that are going to be merging, intertwining, interweaving, and mixing in order to get your own conclusions. This is very important to take into consideration for classroom management elements, which are part of the following activity you are to carry out. And I'm going to give you an example of how it matches with learning theories, acquis acquisition theories, and methodologies, whether current or traditional for teaching and learning languages. Oh. So this is going to be your task, OK, to, to inquire by your own. Inquire, Piaget, Vygotsky, Brunner, crushing cognitive constructivism, social constructivism, active learning, and hypothesis of crushing. Now, what is classroom management? Well, classroom management can be defined as, you know, procedures or actions taken to create and keep a learning atmosphere that supports instructional goals. What is an instructional goal? Well, those are very well planned descriptions of what is expected, you know, and it also has to do with the teacher's roles, the learner variables, and the objectives regarding language. So instructional goals have to do with your teaching and including your roles, you are a planner or you are about to be a planner. If you don't plan to be a teacher, don't worry, because eventually you will have to explain that to a person or to someone who's asking you to solve a language problem. And you will have to choose and you will have to select appropriate instructions 
and procedures and planning in order to explain what you gotta share, what you your knowledge. So this is a, um, a connection, a systematic connection between theories, approaches, methodologies, and tasks. You know, some other authors may call them activities, others assignments, you know. But the word task, according to Richardson Rogers, actually includes what, you know, these instructional goals aim at, which are specific objectives for language proficiency, for language mastery, for language learning, for language acquisition, etc. So we're going to check how to give instructions, which is part of classroom management. And a good rule of thumb is going to be to take into account Bloom's taxonomy. Bloom's taxonomy for, you know, giving instructions for your discourse, for your teaching discourse and for your writing or spoken language. Another definition for classroom management is the process of organization and conducting the business of the classroom. The business of the classroom is the teaching and learning processes. OK, this is the business of the classroom, but it, it, it can also uh, move forward, you know, to what happens with social interaction. Well, this is a, a representation of managing the classroom. First and foremost, the teacher use of L1 or L2, as I said, you know, as I said a couple of minutes ago, everything is connected. There are certain theories which state that the use of L1 might be helpful and might work for a specific context. You know, remember, now it's the time when we need to take into consideration the learner variables and the pedagogical implications. It's not the same to teach a two year old than to teach a teenager, right? It's completely different, a completely different world of teaching. So the use of L1 might be beneficial for a specific context and situations, such as giving instructions, working with a, 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 a specific audience, you know. However, you know, we have different theories. There are some others, such as Krashen's hypothesis, who state that the use of L2 is fundamental for managing the classroom. And the use of L1 is not even in the agenda, you know. And according to Krashen, you know, the use of L2 should be addressed at all times just because you need a strategies for giving instructions. And those strategies for giving instructions are focusing on Bloom's taxonomy of hots and lots, higher order thinking skills and lower order thinking skills. It also includes the characteristics of learners in a broad sense, of course, but those characteristics are adaptable. So whenever you're giving instructions, you can measure them yeah, well, you don't measure them, but you can classify them, you know, according to the needs of your classroom, the needs of your students. Um, remember that the variables of teachers and learners have an impact on the um, on the classroom uh, issues, you know, but think of sitting arrangement, which is number three. OK, you will see how everything is connected. I was trying to give you an example of public education in Mexico. If you, for any reason, happen to teach at a high school and you go to the high school and you find a classroom with 50 people, 50 teenagers, OK, who are full of energy, who are looking forward to moving, and who get distracted very easily and are thinking of 
everything but learning, you will find that sitting arrangement is a turning point for education. And sitting arrangement has to do also with language acquisition theories, with methodologies, with current approaches. Just take a look at the way the desks are arranged in a 50 students classroom, orderly rows, because otherwise it's impossible to take care of 50 people. Try it out, you know, go for a horseshoe sitting arrangement and you will see how they get more distracted than expected. Try to make a circle with 50 people there in a classroom, you know, it's uh, something to bear in mind. And there the approaches are present just because you know, the traditional grammar translation method is having an impact on sitting arrangement and sitting arrangement is ha having an impact on the methodology itself. It's an interconnection just because if you go to, well, things are changing at the moment eh, because of the lockdown. Yeah, and because of uh, the fact that education is now in a critical period. It's in a critical period, things are about to change. But just one year ago, eh, with a face-to-face um, -face classes, you know, students used to be taught by the grammar translation method, just because they were arranged in, a, in, in orderly rows. And the role of the teacher was the one of knowledge supplier. So everything is connected with classroom management, and with approaches and methods. So uh, the ways we communicate nowadays are quite different. You know, this day and age, we have a different kind of interaction and participation and empowerment. So uh, it would be a good opportunity to come up with new ideas, with new approaches. And this is actually what scientists call a change of paradigm. And a, a change of paradigm in education is about to happen. Um, well, another element for classroom management to be taken into account is the importance of planning and turn taking. As I said, regarding face to face classes and regarding face to face interaction, turn taking is a negotiation, but planning is compulsory for you to get to explain what you want to explain and um, for your learners you know or the people who are about to learn from you to uh focus on what you want them to okay so planning is for that is for students to get attention you know to be focused on what you want them to Oh, wait, sorry, sorry. So let's take a look at the roles of teachers. Uh -huh. uh, the um, well, emerging data has established a couple of labels and roles for teachers, but it all depends on the context. Um, a teacher uh, for postgraduate students, you know, uh, or graduate students at university uh, plays the role of a tutor, the role of an advisor, um, the role of a researcher, the role of a manager, the role of a policy maker, or well, plenty of roles that make up the effectiveness of teachers, you know, which uh, it's a touchy topic, you know, to call effective a professor or a good professor, let's say the ideal professor, the ideal teacher. However, when working with children, the characteristics might change dramatically because you need to think of education, you know, and teaching and separate it because you are somehow an extension of the first institution, which is home. So um, it's very interesting to see how your roles are shaped and change constantly, even from group to group. 
because the roles you play in a group might be different from the ones you play in another group which has got a different personality. However, you know, research, serious research, has stated the most common uh, characteristics of the and one of them is this one that I wanted to share with you. Withiness, according to uh, um, uh, uh, Cunning. The teacher is responsible for uh, working with behavior, you know. They can keep this strategy by means of observational skills, you know, or um, this witness has to do with the identification and detection of the student's characteristics, you know, um, to a certain extent you're with them, you know, and you make them feel you're with them by means of a, a, your role of a, a action researcher. The, se the second one is overlappingness. That is the effectiveness in managing situations which happen at the same time. Let's give you an example to continue with online education. Some students are, you know, looking forward to finishing the tasks and they go in a very fast rhythm and you need to be prepared as a teacher in order to cover their needs. It's not that you're going to improvise, but you need to think of different rhythms in your classroom, sorry. <clears throat> because you also have students who are about to deliver their tasks and you need to, you know, um, cover everybody's needs. So you need to prepare and plan and adapt, you know, your classroom so that you can be on time with everybody or most of them because sometimes it's impossible. But this is one of your roles, you know. You need to be a, um, a problem solver, you know, in order to uh, adapt your room to, um, it, 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 to cover everybody's needs. Yeah, uh, if you have a person who task very fast, well, you should have a reading prepared for them you know, to go over their reading or, you know, to uh, give them an assignment, you know, and to say, well, now you need to do this in order to complete the task, you know, or, you know, give them a little bit of power, you know, so that they can be working, you know, instead of wasting time. We're going to explore this in depth so that you can get it, you know, because from my personal perspective, you know, in my personal opinion, you cannot deal with such problems or constraints until you are teaching, you know. You need to face it and, and then you come up with solutions and potential solutions. The next role would be smoothness and momentum, you know, trying to avoid slowdowns during the class, keeping up the, the, the rhythm between activities uh, and this also can be implemented in, in King work for online education and instructional design, how you design your tasks and what they aim at. OK, the teacher should make sure that the tasks remain short and that are, are accurate, you know, for uh, a, a specific uh, periods of time, whether a week, two weeks, two days, five minutes, just to avoid people to get bored, people to uh, uh, lose their motivation, okay? Group alerting, well, to keep students interested, motivated to encourage participation, and very importantly, to keep suspense in class, in a positive sense, of course, you know, because you have everything arranged and prepared and planned. Because you want them to feel secure, you want your your uh, students to feel secure and you as as learners might reflect that you feel really certain when your teacher has got everything planned 
and they know what they are doing. So as a student, you might feel, OK, yeah, I think he knows what he's trying to do or what she's trying to state. But suspense refers to a, you know, a positive in the classroom. But it's a good point, you know, now that we're talking about it. Some of you might feel comfortable with teachers who are really systematic and who manage uh, due times for delivering tasks. And some others might feel more comfortable with teachers who are easy going, um, you know, they have a freer approach. Um, they give you the opportunity to express yourself in different manners and rather than guidelines and due dates and deadlines, they foster expression, you know, so it also depends on the eye you're looking at teachers roles and characteristics. According to research, those five are, you know, commonalities among contexts around the world. Knowledgeable, empathetic, manager, organized and patient. Those are adjectives that might define the general uh, characteristics of teachers. Of course, regarding knowledge, they refer to knowledge of the matter, that is language proficiency. And I think you know, for language learners, both and for language teachers, your continuous training regarding language is fundamental. You need to keep on certifying your language. If you got the first certificate of English, that's OK. If you got the certificate in advanced English, perfect. If you go for the proficiency level, well, it's even better. You continue learning at all times. You never stop learning. You know, language is still evolving. It's constantly changing. So you need to train yourself. You need to keep prepared. And that is to be knowledgeable about the language. You know, that is knowledge of the matter. But you also need knowledge of the subject matter. And that's sometimes even more important than language. But it depends on the context, you know. Some contexts and some students rather attend a lesson from a native English speaker, while others, you know, go for teachers who are uh, really knowledgeable about the subject matter, that is how to transmit knowledge, pedagogical knowledge, which is also important, right? When we are having a conversation, when we are interacting with people, we need to know how to approach them and differently because it's a negotiation and teaching is too. OK, so uh, the more prepared you are to share your thoughts, to teach, well, the more likely learning is going to take place. Empathetic has to do with knowing your students' uh, variables, your students' characteristics, in order to um, put yourself, you know, in their very own situations. You know, uh, I think this is also very important for teachers. Manager, well, yeah, of course, this has to do with planning as well as organized. You know, you need to be systematic. Although your teaching methodology or approach might not be systematic because we are facing changes nowadays, you need to be organized and use your metacognitive strategies in order to plan, you know, and uh, transmit a certainty to your students. And patience, which is um, uh, we all need to work on. I had prepared an activity, but I just want to be more straightforward and the, and I think you're going to cover this in the in, in activity 1.1, which is about the teacher's roles. So uh, I don't think that's going to be necessary. Well, what I was trying to get at is that 
the teacher's roles may vary according to the group, according to the age of learners, and according to the uh, curriculum and external conditions, external factors. Sometimes teachers might play the role of a priest, of a guide, of a preacher, of a guru, uh, of, a, of, of a consultant, etc., depending on the needs of learners. But it, that doesn't mean that our teaching style is going to be changing at all times. No, but adaptation to take place. In sum, the effective teacher, you know, your characteristics as learners, you know, and eventually as teachers are going to be focused on language, which is the main thing, you know, language is there in the middle because Nowadays, we center teaching on learners rather than um, on, 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 on instructional goals. You know, we need to take into consideration that it's different to state an approach which is learner center. You know, and uh, and learning center. What I'm trying to get at is that you might center your teaching on learners, but you will have to avoid losing control of language goals. So I would rather say that teaching has to be centered on learning, you know, because you can't forget about the language goals. Otherwise, the needs of your learners are going to be moduling, you know, and playing a, a crucial role in teaching. And language has to, OK? That's what I'm trying to mean. But you have here a summary of the characteristics, master of the language, master of pedagogical issues, um, a, a provide a appropriate atmospheres for learning, personal qualities, um, um, Interaction, uh, interaction skills for handling students and personal factors which need to be worked out in order to avoid burning out. Now, giving instructions. For giving instructions, uh, uh, we might find constraints, both learners and teachers. If instructions are not accurately provided, uh, there is a sense of uh, um, uncertainty, you know, and, and this actually deters learning, which is something we really need to avoid. Um, we could use some strategies for giving instructions, whether to students, learners, or people in general, and that's to plan our instructions by focusing on higher order thinking skills or lower order thinking skills according to the person we want to give the instruction to. Another good strategy is compensatory skills, moving your hands, gestures, observation skills, movement, body language, mimic, etc. So uh, for giving instructions, remember that we are negotiating meaning, but we want them to focus on what we expected to. This is Bloom's taxonomy of higher order thinking skills and lower order thinking skills. What I was trying to oh, sorry, what happened? Uh, what I was trying to mean was that whenever you think of instructions, whether in a dialogue, in a conversation, in the classroom, you need to think of what you want them to learn or what you want them to get from your message. And of course, age is going to be a factor to be taken into account, context, approach, method, style. So uh, you might be working with remembering uh, categories or understanding categories for uh, addressing children. You know, they need to memorize, duplicate, define, Stay, reproduce, repeat, drill, classify, report, select, identify, explore. Okay. 
Uh, but if you're working with, let's say, university students, of course, you're going to go for the creative dimension of the of the taxonomy and you include in your instructions verbs to, to, to trigger thinking, you know, such as construct or create or design or evaluate or compare or discriminate or evaluate. OK, so these verbs might be um, underestimated, but they connect, you know, they have got deep inside uh, a purpose, a purpose that has to do with your method, with your approach, with your uh, with your ideas of language acquisition, language learning, with your ideas of you know covering situations regarding learner variables so they define you know what you want them to do with language what you want your learners to do with the uh, with their with their skills and this day and age you know to develop critical thinking is a must here you have the link if you want to explore more about bloom's taxonomy you can do it I suggest doing it, you know, explore it by your own, check how it can be useful for determining instructions, okay? For instructional design as well, you know, for working online, it's not the same to ask a student to define a theory than to compare a theory or a concept. So they play a paramount role for teaching and learning as a whole. Oh, shit. So, another element for classroom management is setting arrangement. And I just gave you the example of a, a 50 classroom high school situation. Um, there are many ways for desks to be arranged, but it will be done according to um, you know your needs as a teacher and the the needs of learners as well. You know um, you could think of the situations you faced if you went to a private school and you used to work in circles. You know if you went to a a public institution with a constructivist philosophy and approach. You might uh, you might have a, had a different uh, sitting arrangement, which is a two lines, you know, or circles, an organization, etc. So everything is connected, you see. And Harmer uh, exposes a couple of sitting arrangements that could be functional and helpful for both teaching and learning processes separate tables, solo work, circle, orderly rows, horseshoe, and there you can see, you know, the monitoring of the teacher, the movements and the interaction that might be taking place in each of the situations. Let's describe each of them. Well, this was an activity for you, but I don't think that's going to be necessary because you've got a, a classroom management task and that's going to and everything we are discussing now it's going to be represented there hopefully um well what you need to do is to think and to reflect on the specific tasks activities you know that could be work for each of the sitting arrangements harmer proposes for example um a, a quiz you could use this uh, a orderly rows or solo work for coloring and drawing. OK, separate tables. You know, if you want to work with a uh, phonetics, OK, a circle or you want to go for a role play. Well, I think that the horseshoe might be the most suitable way to arrange the desks. OK, so um, think of the advantages and disadvantages and the suitable activities that could be implemented you know, or, or your own experiences as learners, the ones you have experienced and how they work. If you attended 
a high school in the public education system in Mexico, well, the solo work was the way we used to see it, you know, because I was in the public school. Um, and, and of course, it determines the way we learn languages to a certain extent. So those are the things you need to think to, to think of. Sorry. I posted, well, that's not going to be necessary. Here you have an explanation for each. The horseshoe, the horseshoe, sorry. Yeah, I'm a little bit uh, um, uh, distracted. And um, the separate tables, um, uh, orderly roads, solo work and circle. What you need to do is to think of activities you experience and the implications they got for your learning and that will eventually have for you, your teaching for some of you. For, for uh, summing up everything, you know, in a nutshell, effective classroom manager is the one who takes advantage of learning time by using noticing skills and, you know, uh, diminishes behavioral problems, but not only face-to-face -face implementations, but also, you know, um, but also um, online education. Instead of sitting arrangement and desks moving in your classroom, you might be able now, this day and age, to use appropriate uh, tools, platforms, applications to manage the classroom, you know, and establish turn taking, establish participation agreements, and, uh, you know, moving from one platform to another might lead to the development of certain cognitive skills and certain uh, uh, critical skills. So those are the conclusions. Everything is merging. You could see, you know, from the very beginning, our perceptions on language, the construction of our identity as learners, the potential characteristics of teachers, methodologies and approaches for the sake of both processes, teaching and learning. These are the references. Uh, I forgot to include questions, but don't worry, I'm going to be sending you the, uh, the, the references and, and, and the files as well regarding question for you to read and in Cameron as well for including um, Piaget, Vygotsky and Brunner. Okay. <clears throat> Wait. Okay. Um, in, okay. Now, it would be nice to hear from you. Um, this is the time for you to speak up your queries, your questions, comments, uh, suggestions, or observations. Um, I'm listening to you. Uh, okay, no, no questions, but I hope you're there. <laughs> If you're not there, well, I'm at least recording the session. Um, well, I guess, um, you know, I try to um, catch your uh, queries, your um, the, the most relevant participations of your previous tasks and provide with an introduction for the following ones, which have to do with classroom management, such as teacher roles in sitting arrangement and, and also uh, um, learning theories, acquisition theories. So um, I think um, I'm going to be presenting uh, separately, uh, separately the, the uh, active learning theory and then one more theory which is about a, a social constructivism uh, with Bronner and Vygotsky and finally with Krashen in a very succinct manner, very, very briefly. And I hope they are taken into consideration and they are placed and, in, and, in, and involved, you know, uh, represented in your tasks. That would be 
brilliant. That would be really, really good. Uh, do, do you have any questions? No, you still have today for delivering your tasks. Also, uh, Monday, I think, you know, for uh, the fourth task, as far as I remember. Be patient, you know, uh, I have a bunch of homework to get through. It takes lots of time checking your papers, checking your participations, uh, keeping a record of your performance and giving feedback. It takes a lot of time, believe me. Uh, but I'm doing my best and I think you are doing your best as well. And I really appreciate it for that. It's really valuable and that's why I think this is working. But uh, you give me your your uh, opinions, please. Someone was there trying to work. OK, for me, um, it was nice. And now I understand how how is this space of working um, working? Uh, I didn't know uh, these techniques of forming uh, files and the horseshoe and that all they have a different um, they how to say it they give a different input to the students, right? So, well, it was really interesting for me. Ah, oh, thank you, Haniel. Uh, thank you for your participation. You're right, you know, interaction changes dramatically according to uh, sitting arrangement and according to your movements in the classroom as a teacher, facilitator. Remember that the teacher is seen as, you know, a figure of authority, you know, that's, Mexican culture and um, um, but sometimes you know the figure of the teacher is more seen as a facilitator even though we have two different perceptions you know or even more perceptions around the world regarding the figure of the teacher sitting arrangement has an impact on interaction you're right has an impact on interaction and how you arrange desks and your room for learning, whether online, you know, or face to face in traditional teaching. It's made up of your previous conceptions of language and theories because your role is to organize the classroom. And if I decide to use Microsoft Teams is because of a reason and because I was trained, you know, to make decisions that way and to shape, you know, a classroom. But if another group decides to use Zoom, is Zoom, it will be for a, for a different need, reason, for a different need and for a different purpose. The same might happen when you're teaching face to face, you know, and you're arranging your desks in a line because you want them to move, because they need to move. Or if you go for a horseshoe, because you want them to focus on what you are presenting in front of them, or because you want to follow a seminar approach for learning and teaching. So it does have a, an impact on, uh, on learning and teaching, but it's constructed by what we are checking in unit one, and that's very important to be aware of. So thank you, Daniel. Another comment or question, please. This is your time for participation. Uh, well, uh, I would like to say that all the things that you have already said are very interesting and important because, like, for example, the student arrangement, I didn't know and I didn't understand why uh, teachers um, uh, did that. So I think it's interesting all these um, knowledge that we um, that we that we acquire during this session, and I think it's are interesting. Thank you, Jimena. Yes, you're right. It is. It is, and and it uh, and it will um, it, it will enhance discussion and reflection. The the main objective was to um, 
enhance discussion, you know, and I think we reach the goal because we can tell, we can tell from your videos. Yeah, we videos. I think your videos are really valuable. You know, I spent for about two days watching you, but it was worth it. I enjoyed it. You know, I really enjoy it. And it was it was great for me. You know, I, I'm, I'm really thankful with you all. Um, uh, anybody else who wants to participate? If you don't have any more curious questions, I just want to let you know that I will be looking forward to checking your task uh, four and your task five, five point one. Um, do you know the deadlines? You know, but the due times, they're not deadlines, you know, they're not, uh, uh, they're not gonna disappear, right? But, you know, um, specifications are there. Specifications are there. Um, uh, I'm gonna be sending you an email as usual, giving you proper instructions of the following task for week three and four. And um, well, I have already done that uh, yesterday, I think so. But um, um, I'm going to let you know when we are meeting. This first unit is full of theory, OK? You're, you're aware of that. It's full of theory. But then we have unit two, <coughs> unit three, and unit four, which are about the language Did skills. You? Yeah, sorry. One more comment. Um, <clears throat> sorry for coming in so late uh, because I didn't realize we even had class today because I was checking my Gmail account. I was checking my E minus account and I never found them. And only half an hour later, I realized, oh my God, maybe I should check my uh, third account, which, and that's one thing that really, in my opinion, is messed up by the way that you have to check 1,000 million accounts to uh, email accounts to find out whether you have class or not. Would you please be so kind and uh, send us um, also the information when we're going to have our next class again in um, in uh, E minus, for example, or on our Gmail account? Because sure. I was searching okay. for both and, and I, I didn't find them, and that's why I, I was like more than half an hour late. I, I was like, do we now have class or not? And then I was like, oh yeah, oh damn, I forgot to check the third account I have, the third Gmail account I have only for this momentary uh, purposes so i didn't even realize basically in the in the beginning that we had class as we also had some assignments which we were supposed to hand in till monday so i was like what <laughs> sorry <laughs> just wanted to apologize yeah, for thank that. you thank you for that daniel uh, you're right you know uh, i will take care of that and i will send you an email uh, to eminus and gmail and 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 also by your UV account, um, you need to be proactive as well. So it's a, a dialogue in the end. And I and I think I remember uh, that I told you that you know the invitations for meeting up online were gonna be sent to your UV accounts. But you know I can do it. I don't have any problem so that you can be informed. That's my promise. Okay, I will. And, and if you didn't attend the first hour of the lesson, don't worry because this is being recorded, okay? And it's going to be uploaded. For you know, all, right, all of you. you. Yeah. This is one of the advantages of working online, you know, that can be recorded and we can uh, check it again. And working, you know, in a synchronic manner, you know, it's a, it shows a lot of constraints, you know, because uh, we need to be uh, really specific and, you know, communication constraints happen all the time, but we're going to solve it. Yeah. Um, I've, I've, I lost my train of thought. I don't know what I was, <laughs> what I was uh, talking about, but um, if you don't have any more questions, uh, I guess um, you will uh, complete your tasks and uh, you will wait for my emails. And I'm going to be um, 
I'm gonna be sending you. Um, uh, by the way, if you wish, uh, you know, uh, and if you feel uh, more comfortable, you can uh, text me and then we can keep in touch there as well. Okay. Um, does anybody have a question or? I was trying to uh, I, I was trying to say something, but I totally forgot. You know, I lost my train of thought. I can't remember. But you know, if it is important, you will come back. No more questions or comments. No, not really. No, well, teacher. So, okay. Uh, this is gonna be uploaded. Okay, you can watch the presentation again. And uh, remember that everything we discussed today um, has to do with uh, um, your following and your previous tasks. And it would be good, you know, to uh, bear it in mind for um, carrying out your activities. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much for your time, for your efforts, for your participations. Uh, well, most of your videos were really relevant for me and for your classmates. Um, and that's something I really appreciate. Okay. Thank you very much. Have a lovely day. Enjoy your weekend and we can catch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, teacher. Mr. Thank you. Thanks. Take care. Have a good day. You too. Bye. Thank you, teacher. Bye. Bye, bye, bye. Bye, teacher. See you. Bye. Thanks.